I'm going to be talking um, about um, one part of um, a bigger project um, today. And so this is what I want to cover in the 50 to 60 minutes I'm going to be speaking for. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the bigger project, which is called the Euro Students Project. Um, and then I'm going to go into much more detail about um, this specific um, presentation and the arguments that I want to make in relation to policy documents in particular. So I'll tell you a little bit about the academic background to the arguments I want to make, a little bit about the research methods that I use, um, and then the key parts of the presentation are going to be talking about some of the dominant ways in which higher education students are talked about or constructed in policy documents across Europe. And then secondly, offering some possible explanations for these um, patterns, and then I shall conclude. But as I go through, I'm going to be talking about things that will be very familiar to you because you are higher education students. So if you can think about um, any alternative explanations for the patterns I'm talking about, I'd be really pleased to hear them. And I think there's time at the end for us to have um, questions and answers discussion. So if you've got any, any thoughts on what I'm saying, please do share those at, at the end. Okay. So, um, a little bit about the bigger project um, to, to start with. Um, it's funded by the European Research Council and um, we're based at the University of Surrey in the UK. I'm based in the Department of Sociology, but the project itself is meant to be very interdisciplinary in nature. So, I draw on perspectives um, from, for example, um, educational studies as well as sociology. Um, geography, human geography, um, policy studies, and politics to some extent. Um, and we're a four-person team. We're, we're quite small, um, but um, we've all taken responsibility for different parts of the project in the data collection phase. Um, and we're going to be coming together to analyse the data um, a, a little bit later. So the project started um, almost two years ago, in August um, 2016, and we've got another three years to go with the project. So we're currently in the middle of it, and um, we're currently out collecting data. So um, as you just heard, I'm in Warsaw um, to conduct some interviews with policymakers over the next few days, which is um, quite an important part of the project. <laughs> If you're interested, um, we have a project website where there's more information and some of the papers that we've written. And uh, if you use social media, we have um, a Twitter account too, so you can find out a bit more um, on that. So the project itself is underpinned by four main research questions. And um, you can see them up there, but I'll just um, read them out as well. So first of all, how are understandings of the higher education student? And I should say, here we're mainly interested in national students, so we have excluded international students from our sample. How are understandings of the higher education student produced, shaped and disseminated by policy makers, the media and higher education institutions? Secondly, to what extent do these understandings differ within and across European countries? Thirdly, how do students of different national and social backgrounds understand the role of the student? And to what extent are their understandings consonant with or similar to those produced, shaped and disseminated by policymakers, the media and higher education institutions? So we're looking at the extent to which there are differences between European countries, but also the extent to which there are differences within each of those countries too. And the background for this project, why I thought it'd be an interesting thing to do, is that um, firstly I think there's an assumption within a lot of European policy that being a student is the same everywhere, that people can move across European countries, for example through Erasmus schemes, and that you know, this is unproblematic, that being a student is, is the same everywhere. But also when we look at the academic literature, we can see similar types of assumption being made. So in the sociology of education, lots of people argue that across Europe, all systems are being highly marketised, all students are becoming consumers of higher education, and that neoliberal and neoliberal global pressures are making 
higher education students the same everywhere. And I suppose, having visited a few European countries myself, I had questions about whether there was actually any empirical evidence to support those kinds of claims. So the project is to look at that and to provide some empirical evidence to make a judgment. But I suppose also, teaching in England, I thought that actually a lot of assumptions were made that because we have very high fees in England, that all students automatically behave like consumers. But I suppose from my experience teaching students, I had some questions about that. So I was really interested in whether students themselves shared the view of themselves that policymakers had. Are they consumers or do they see their role in a different way? So that was the reason for looking <coughs> within each of our countries at different perspectives. So students, staff, policymakers, and the media. So hopefully that's given you a bit of background, and I'll come back to some of those points um, later on. So we're collecting data in six different European countries, Denmark, England, Germany, Ireland, Poland, and Spain. And I chose those countries to some extent for pragmatic reasons, because it's helpful for me to have two English-speaking countries in there. I've already done a bit of work with Denmark. But um, from a kind of um, research design perspective, I wanted to have diversity um, in terms of welfare regime. So was the country um, a social democratic uh, welfare state, like in Denmark, a more neoliberal one, like in England? Um, have some variation there. I wanted to have uh, different relationships to the European Union. So some countries that have become part of the European Union more recently, like Poland, compared to much longer standing members like Germany. I should say I wrote the proposal for this before the Brexit vote in England and that has brought a slightly new dimension um, to, to the project but the idea was to include England as a member of the European Union. And then also to have some diversity in relation to tuition fees and this is quite important for some of the arguments I want to go on to make um, later. And also have differences in terms of the student support system, so whether students are offered loans or not, um, and how much those loans might be for, might be for. So this is a table which I don't expect you to look at all the detail, but just shows those different dimensions of, of diversity. The welfare regime, date at which they joined the European Union, um, tuition fees or not, and student support. But I suppose the key thing for the rest of the presentation is really um, the um, tuition fees because one of the arguments I'm going to make is that um, how higher education is funded has quite a big impact on how the role of the student is understood. So I suppose the variation is from some countries um, such as Denmark which have um, low fees to the other end of the spectrum um, where we have very high fees um, in, in England. And we can come back to that um, perhaps a bit um, at, at the end. And so for each of our strands of data collection, sorry, each of our um, research questions, we're looking at four different um, strands of data. So the first strand is the one I'm going to be really focusing on today. And so for each of our six countries, we have looked at a range of policy texts and analysed those. And then we're currently in the middle of conducting interviews with policymakers in each of the countries. Um, to look at media representations, we're analysing how students are talked about in national newspapers, but also in popular films or um, TV programmes that feature students prominently. And then to get the institutional or the university perspective, um, we've um, analysed university websites in each of the countries and we've also conducted interviews with members of staff in um, the six countries. And for each country we've chosen three universities or higher education institutions um, and we've tried to sort of um, represent as much as possible the diversity of the higher education sector in that choice of institutions, although that hasn't always been possible. And then to get student understandings, we've held focus groups um, with students um, in each of the three institutions in each of the six countries. So um, we've talked to quite a lot of students um, across Europe and we've conducted the Polish ones um, fairly, fairly recently. 
And one of the fun things that we get the students to do in the focus groups is to make plasticine models, play doh kind of plasticine of how they uh, think about being a student. And we found that works, that works quite well. So that's the project um, as a whole. Today, I'm really going to be focusing on our analysis of the policy text, because that part of the project is kind of done, and the rest of it, a lot of it is, is ongoing. So um, that's what I'm going to be um, focusing on from, from now onwards. So just to give you a bit of the academic background um, to what I'm going to be um, talking about. First of all, you might say, well, why look at policy documents? Why is that interesting? Why is that important? And I think if we look at the academic literature, there's quite a strong argument that, that policy documents do a lot of political work. They're not just kind of neutral documents that say what a government is going to do. They help to shape people's views about what is a social problem, what is um, an appropriate course of action. And some people have argued that they also can, can be quite influential in shaping how we view the world. So I would say it's quite important to look at these kind of documents because they are influential. Um, and some people have argued that, that going a bit further, they could constrain um, what can be said and what can't be said by talking in particular ways. They might exclude particular ways of looking at a social issue um, and make another way of looking at it um, much more likely. And I suppose this is bound up with the view that language isn't neutral, it's inherently political. So that's kind of why I think it's important to look at mm -hmm. policy documents. Um, and I think if we look at previous work that's been done on the way in which higher education students um, are talked about in policy documents, um, there are a number of themes that, that come through. So in the UK, there's been a little bit of work in this area, and it has argued, as I sort of mentioned earlier, that students are seen by government um, as consumers of higher education, um, higher education being seen as a kind of private good rather than public good, um, and that they're sometimes seen as entrepreneurs rather than kind of you know, critical thinkers, but they're seen as entrepreneurs. And, and there's been another piece of work that stressed um, how government assumes that um, higher education students are independent. They don't work collaboratively. It is independence that is seen as most important. If you look at international students, there's a little bit of literature on international students, which has argued that the policy, they're often seen as tradable objects, so they bring things with them um, that people we need to attract because of the themes that they bring. Um, but can also be valuable human capital, so if they stay in the country to work, they can um, contribute to the economy in that way, and also be a political ally, so if they go back home, um, they can kind of defend that country's interests in their national contexts. And some of the work has also pointed out that policy can be um, contradictory as well. But I suppose when we look at that body of work, there are some quite big gaps as far as I'm concerned. First of all, <coughs> most of the work focuses largely on English-speaking countries. So to me, um, there's very little work on policy constructions um, in other, other countries. And secondly, a lot of the work is about one national context. There's very little comparative work which looks at to what extent things are similar or different across countries. And so I thought it was also useful to look at that. And thirdly, a lot of the previous work has focused very much on government policy documents, um, whereas we don't really hear the voices of other um, groups in society who might be influencing policy. And so um, I thought all three of those things could be better or could be done better in, in the current project. And then the third area of literature that this project, this, this kind of paper um, speaks to, are arguments about European homogenisation. Everything's becoming the same across Europe, irrespective of what country you're in. And I just talked about that earlier in terms of the kind of rationale for the, for the project as a whole, but that's certainly relevant to what I want to say today as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about the academic background. In terms of the, the methods, um, we analysed um, 92 policy texts from across the, the six countries. Um, and in most countries, although not quite all, we tried to get um, this kind of split of documents. So four speeches by government ministers responsible. 
responsible for higher education, four government strategy documents, four documents from unions, um, two from unions that represent higher education staff, and two from organisations that represent higher education students, so in Poland that would be the Students' Parliament, um, and then four documents from employers' organisations. Um, we chose these documents because of um, their national significance, um, their focus on students, so all those documents had to have a large focus on students, and um, we tried to choose the most recent documents possible of the ones that met the first two criteria. Obviously not all of these documents were in English, so we did translate um, those that were in other languages to English <coughs> before analysis. And then we used some um, NPIVO software, so kind of a software package, um, to make sure that we um, analysed all those documents um, quite, quite rigorously. So, what did we find? So, um, I think first of all it's important to say that across the documents there were some similarities. And I suppose the most obvious similarity was that students were being presented as future workers, that higher education was understood as, in many ways, a, a preparation for the labour market. So the ways in which students were talked about in all six countries did really emphasise um, that they were there um, to, to prepare them for, for, for getting employment later on. But I think also what's really important and what I want to spend more time talking about today is some of the kind of key differences between countries, but also to some extent within countries, because I think these raise questions about the um, arguments that I was talking about just a minute ago about things becoming the same across Europe. And I think these differences um, suggest that actually there are still quite important differences between um, um, European countries, but also between different groups within them. And I'm going to give you four examples of some of those differences today. Firstly, the extent to which students were seen as objects of criticism, and since you're student, most of you are students, that might not seem very nice, but um, it's the way in which they were talked about in some of the policy documents. Secondly, the way in which students were sometimes talked about as vulnerable and in need of protection. Thirdly, about the way in which um, they were seen as either an individual investor in their higher education or as part of a societal investment, so you know, kind of um, an investment for wider society. And fourthly, what I've called spatial provenance, but what I mean by this, mm -hmm. and you'll see it a, a bit later, is um, the extent to which students were seen as kind of nationals or Europeans or international citizens. What was the kind of geography that was being attached to them? Okay, so I'm going to go through those for um, differences, and then I'm going to offer some explanations for them. But as I go through, um, you might want to think about whether you can think of any alternative um, explanations, because I'm sure mine aren't, aren't exhausted. Okay, so to start with the first one, students as objects of criticism. And this was um, most evident in the documents from Poland and from Denmark. And I've got some examples here to show you the kind of thing that I mean. So one of the arguments that is made in both Poland and Denmark is that there are too many students and they're not of high enough quality. And I'm sure this doesn't apply to you, um, but in the Polish document, um, uh, this is from the government here, we, it says, during the last 20 years, higher education was subject to dramatic quantitative and institutional transformations. The establishment of non-public higher education institutions became possible and non-public forms of education were introduced, causing a nearly five-fold increase in the number of students. This huge success in quantitative terms has not been accompanied so far by a policy orientated towards a significant improvement in quality. So this is one of the key arguments that's made in the Polish documents, that higher education has expanded a lot, but at the expense of the quality of the students in, in higher education. And it's very interesting that very similar arguments are made in Denmark too. Uh, and so this is from um, a speech by a Danish government minister, and he said, in recent years, I find that we have focused too much on quantity, which means the number of students getting through our education system 
we wanted as many people as possible to get a higher education degree. It was understandable, it was understandable and sympathetic ambition, no doubt about that. But time has come to turn our focus to quality. So very similar arguments made here um, about the kind of low quality of um, higher education students. Another similarity between Poland and Denmark is the way in which students are seen as making um, poor subject choices. So they're choosing the wrong subjects to study. Um, and so again, here's a quotation from a Polish government document where it says, the structure of the student body broken down by the main groups of subjects studied underwent adverse change. We have too many graduates and students and subjects classified as social sciences, commerce and law and education, while there may soon be a shortage of graduates in the health and social care science and technology industry and construction groups. And if you look at the Danish documents, there are very, very similar arguments made there about students kind of choosing the wrong subjects, which don't lead to good jobs at the end of it. I suppose one of the things that we see in the Danish documents that we don't see in Poland is also this criticism of students for being too slow, for taking too much time over their degree. And this pops up a lot in, in the Danish documents, and it's also talked about a lot by other stakeholders. So Danish students take longer to complete their education than what is intended. As such, there is still lots of room for improvement. But I think it's important to say that here I focus mainly on government documents, and these understandings aren't shared by all the policy actors in each of the countries. So for example, in relation to Denmark, Danish unions um, are very critical of this view of students being too slow, um, and they argue that actually um, employers don't want fast learners. What employers want is people who kind of thoroughly learnt their subject matter and have gone into things in, in more depth. So Danish unions are quite critical of this view that the government has. In contrast, in England, if you look at the policy documents, there are no critical comments about students at all. Where the criticisms are made, um, they're directed at um, higher education institutions, the universities themselves, um, or, in the case of the unions, the government. Students are never, never criticised. And in fact, quite the opposite, their good qualities are often emphasised. So, for example, their hard-working nature is emphasised in many of the English documents. So I'm going to come back later on to why this might be the case, but I just wanted to flag up these differences to start with. So the second difference is whether students are seen as vulnerable or not. And so in Poland and Denmark, because they're sort of criticised in this way, they're not seen as vulnerable. But in the other four countries, at various points in the documents, their vulnerability, their need of protection, is talked about quite a lot. And I found this really, really interesting. But what is um, different is that the source of vulnerability differs from country to country. So if we look at Germany, for example, the government argues that students are vulnerable in the face of new technologies unless universities change. So unless universities bring in more new technologies to their teaching, students will be vulnerable. But interestingly, the unions in Germany take a different perspective. They see students as vulnerable because of this change that the government wants to bring in. So they say that it might increase inequalities between students if some students have lots of you know, money to get access to new technologies and others don't, and that if new technologies are used uh, to reduce contact with teaching staff, students might be vulnerable there too. So interestingly, the vulnerability is talked about, but the source of it is quite different in Germany. If we look at England, there's a very similar um, disparity between government and union views, but in relation to marketisation. So the government argues that English students are vulnerable because there hasn't been enough marketisation in England. So they talk about um, university staff defending their own interests and not being um, sufficiently attuned to what students want. Um, whereas the unions argue that students are vulnerable because of marketisation. So in England, the government wants to bring in um, um, a variety of kind of private sector institutions 
um, and the unions, I think, uh, argue that this is going to increase student vulnerability uh, because they're going to be at the, the beck and call of a marketing, uh, more of a marketing higher education. In Spain, students are also talked about as, as vulnerable, but here it's a result um, of poor quality higher education institutions. Um, so we see some similarities between Spain and England, but a different proposed solution. So in England, the solution to poor quality institutions is to bring in more marketisation. In Spain, um, the um, solution is more Europeanisation, and that's something I'll come back to in, in just a minute. And in Ireland, it's future students who are talked about as vulnerable uh, because of insufficient funding in the Irish um, system. Okay, so that's the second um, difference, whether students are seen as vulnerable or not. See, so it's vulnerable in four countries, but not in Poland or Denmark, where they're much more likely to be criticised. The third difference I want to talk about is whether students are seen as individual investors or whether they're part of a sort of social investment in, in higher education. And I suppose um, the most kind of most stark discussion of them as individual investors is seen um, in, in England. So um, two examples here to show you the kind of thing I'm talking about. So the first one from an um, English government document says the quality of teaching should be among the key drivers of a prospective student's investment. So here they're talking about the money, the high fees that a student um, is putting into their higher education and how they're deserving of a high quality uh, teaching experience. Then the second is from um, a speech by the uh, Minister for Higher Education in England and he said they, the students, have been working hard for their final exams and made a significant investment in higher education. They are looking critically at what they get for that investment. And when you read the rest of the speech, um, what he's talking about isn't kind of the, the effort they've put in, it's the money that they've put in. And, and if you look at the English documents, this crops up time and time again, bang for money, the fact that students are paying high fees, and what are they getting from that financial investment? And that, that discourse is very, very strong in, in England. And it's linked to um, another way of talking about students as in possession of consumer rights. And this is talked about in a very explicit way, using the term consumer rights in a number of, of the documents. And one of the documents that we looked at um, is an organisation called the Consumer Markets Authority, which is set up in England to protect consumer rights in a whole variety of areas. So if you buy something from the shops that isn't any good and you don't get your money back, you can go to this authority to complain. But they have also produced a guide for students about how students, if they don't get what they thought they were going to get, how they can complain and ask for their money back. So in England, there's a very strong discourse now about consumer rights. You're paying a lot of money, you are entitled to this. If you don't get it, how do you complain? And um, this is frequently talked about as a bad kind of individual making an investment in their higher education. Um, we don't really see this very much elsewhere in the policy documents. The two exceptions are in Ireland, where um, the, um, the case for investment is, is talked about once in that extract there. And also German employers who talk about individual investment, but German employers have their own agenda, they want fees to be reintroduced um, in, in Germany, so they're saying that you know, actually um, people are much more committed to their higher education when they're paying fees from their own bank account, and this is something good that should be reintroduced. In general, um, Germany, um, we don't see this language of individual investor used at all. What's much more common across the countries um, in the study um, is this sense of higher education being an investment for wider society. It doesn't just bring individual benefit, it brings public benefit too. And I suppose here, this is linked not to kind of an individual rights discourse, the consumer rights discourse that I was talking about in England, but a sense that actually students have responsibilities to wider society because of this social investment that has been made in them. Um, and this is perhaps most clear in the Danish documents. So I've got an extract here 
to illustrate this. So the Danish higher education system is a very important part of the Danish welfare society. It's perfectly legitimate to expect that students are challenged appropriately and that they invest an appropriate amount of effort and time in their studies. Tax-funded higher education is a unique privilege. Higher education requires a massive investment by society. Everyone pays and therefore everyone should benefit. So this sums up quite nicely the idea that you know, it's a social investment and therefore the students have certain responsibilities to put in a, an added appropriate amount of effort and time into their studies. But we also see echoes of it in, in other countries too. Um, an example from Spain here, where we see um, the government minister arguing that in return for this effort of all taxpayers, this kind of social investment, students were asked to improve their performance, which they had more than fulfilled. So here they were talking about um, you know, students improving the kind of level which they were learning at, which they argued that they, they had already done. But there's a sense again of students having a certain responsibility to wider society. Um, because higher education is perceived as a social investment rather than an individual in investment. So the fourth difference I want to talk about is um, what I call the, the spatial provenance. So how students are located geographically um, within these kinds of um, documents. And I think one of the kind of starkest differences is whether they are seen as Europeans or not. And this comes through very strongly in some of the countries um, and um, not at all in um, some of the others. And so students are presented as um, Europeans in Germany, Spain, Poland and Ireland. And I put, again, two quotations up there to, to illustrate that. So Germany is probably the country where this comes through most strongly, um, that the European identity of students is seen as something that's very important and that higher education should be um, kind of furthering, kind of working to, to, to make greater. So from the German speech from a higher education minister, um, we hear um, this. For the generation Erasmus, um, a Europe with national borders is unthinkable. You feel and understand yourself as a European citizen. In the face of nationalism and foreclosure, we are focusing on the more mobility of young people, trainees and students in Europe. But nothing defines the European identity more than personal encounter, as well as experienced and lived cohesion across national boundaries. And in lots of the German um, policy documents and speeches, we have this same sense that actually it's really important to get higher education students moving across Europe to build a sense of European identity. And that is fundamental to the future of Europe, for, um, for peace in Europe, for European prosperity. Um, and that's a very, very strong theme in many of the German documents. Um, the Polish um, government document talks about the European Union um, a fair amount but the language is rather different, um, but um, you know, Europe is still an important thing. So um, to give you a flavour of how um, Europe is talked about in, in Poland, um, there's a, an extract here. So Polish membership of the European Union is a great opportunity for Polish students who are now able to choose the country, higher education institution and field of their study. Students have increasingly better opportunities to learn and obtain the skills required to function in the European labour market. So here we see Europe as a resource that Polish students can use for their labour market advantage, rather than this kind of you know, um, sense that um, um, mobility during higher education is really important for the European political project. But nevertheless, Europe's still being talked about quite a lot in the Polish documents. Um, and we see the same in, um, in, in Spain and Ireland, that Europe is talked about quite a lot in relation to, to, um, to national higher education students. Denmark and England are really interesting in comparison because there are hardly any mentions of Europe in any of the documents from either of the two countries. Um, students are not positioned as Europeans in these documents at all. 
and instead, where um, where countries are made reference to outside of Denmark and England, um, it is um, typically countries outside Europe. So students here, when they're positioned outside the nation state, it is in relation to, to national frames of reference um, instead. Okay, so those, those are the four differences that I wanted to talk about that were most evident when we did um, the policy analysis. And I suppose we spent quite a lot of time thinking about why, why might that be the case. And maybe as I've been talking, you've been coming up with your own theories, which I'd be really interested to hear at the end. But I suppose, it, for me, when I've been thinking about them, I think there are three, three things that, that have um, seemed most convincing to me um, to try and explain these differences between the countries. <laughs> Firstly, the way in which higher education is funded in the different countries, which goes back to that table I showed you um, in the beginning of the presentation. Secondly, the domestic political context. And thirdly, um, geopolitical relations between the countries um, that I've been talking about and um, their, their neighbours um, in a wider world. And so I'm just going to say a little bit about each of these three possible explanations now, and you can think about whether you find them convincing explanations or not. So first of all, the way higher education is funded. And you might remember from the table, there's quite considerable differences across Europe um, in whether um, countries charge fees or not, and high, how high those uh, fees are. And I think what I want to argue is that um, these differences in funding um, have quite a big impact on whether students are seen as objects of criticism or not, and also whether they're seen as investors or investments. And I think this is related to assumptions that are made about um, the relationship between students and the state because of those, those funding mechanisms. So, for example, if we take England, where students pay very high fees, the government is highly dependent on those fees for the funding of the higher education system. So it seems to me that criticising students is a very risky strategy because of the whole sector's dependence on this source of income. So if you criticise students, they might decide, oh, well, maybe higher education is not for me. Um, then you know, the revenue going into the whole sector is likely to decline hugely. And so as a result of this, um, because the government is so dependent on students wanting to come to higher education and being willing to pay for it, it goes to considerable efforts to treat them like customers to ensure that they get what they want and that universities help them to get what they want. And so it's perhaps unsurprising then that higher education becomes talked about as an individual investment because of that high level of fee that is going into it. And because students um, are seen as bearer of rights, that if they don't get what they want, this might affect future students going to university and therefore the, um, the, the viability of the sector. In countries such as, um, such as Denmark, for example, um, and um, Poland, um, where you've got um, much more public funding of higher education, um, you can see that perhaps the large size of the student population might be more problematic, but actually it's all been funded by the state, um, having um, huge numbers to go um, might be seen as, as, as um, more, more problematic. And certainly it's less risky if you um, criticise students in terms of the financial sustainability of the sector. But I think also in a, sense, in a system where um, the public, the taxpayer, is um, funding students' higher education, perhaps their subject choices are more likely to be deemed a legitimate concern of the state. So something the state can have a say in. Whereas if you've got an individualised system where people are paying fees for what they want, it may seem kind of inappropriate for the government to be stepping in to criticise the decisions that they're making because they're seen as kind of like buying a good like you might go into a shop and buy. And so, in a sense, when you've got a publicly funded system, Perhaps it's much more logical that the government is emphasising responsibility to taxpayers rather than individual rights as investors. I think that Poland is quite an interesting case here because um, if you look at the, the documents, it's largely the fee-paying students who come in for those 
those criticisms, the fact that, you know, actually a large amount of the expansion of the sector in Poland has been through part-time students coming in um, and, and paying fees. And so you might argue, thinking about the English case, that it's very dangerous for the government to, 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 to criticise fee-paying students in that way. But I think actually um, this fits the argument quite well because um, in Poland um, we've got a shift, well you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's a shift towards the kind of deprivatisation of the sector. That actually lots of private institutions that had come in charging fees are now being closed down because of the um, changing demographics in, in Poland. And in contrast to England, fee paying students in Poland aren't seen as necessary for the sustainability of the system. Um, and so in this kind of context, criticising them is perhaps not a risky strategy at all. But I just wanted to finish with kind of, you know, on this, this point with a more general um, comment. So we might see it as a kind of good thing that students aren't being criticised in um, policy documents. But I think there's also kind of a negative side to it as well. And it does tend to obscure the role of higher education um, as, as a public good, um, and also the non-economic contributions that students do make to their own learning. So even in England, when they're paying high fees, clearly to get a degree, you need to engage with your own learning, you need to put in effort, and perhaps treating students in this way obscures those important contributions too. So that was the first explanation, I think, the funding mechanism. The second is the, the domestic political context. And if we look at what's happening in these six different countries, I think that sheds some light too on these particular ways in which students are understood. So if we take vulnerability to start with, um, I think if we look at the broader literature on young people and the way they're treated in many European countries, they're often seen as kind of not full political actors. They're kind of, you know, um, citizens in the making because of their, um, their, their age. Um, and so lacking in power political agency, perhaps needing other people to, to, to go after them. And in England, there's quite an interesting discourse that's going out at the moment that students are kind of delicate snowflakes. The millennials aren't, they need kind of safe spaces in their higher education institutions because they can't take dealing with kind of robust um, arguments that come from a different political position, so in need of protection. So there are kind of wider political discourses going on, I think, that, that see young people in particular in, in this way. But I think also if we look at the social policy literature, um, we can see the idea of vulnerability as perhaps one of these kind of universal principles that politicians, policymakers often use because it's very difficult to argue against it. And if you say, you know, we're doing this to protect this vulnerable group, it makes it more difficult for your political opponents to say, well, actually, you know, I don't think that's a good thing to do, because of this kind of, you know, universal principle that you're drawing upon. And so it can be a strategy to neutralize disagreements. And I think the fact that the source of vulnerability is so different in each of the countries I've talked about, but it you know, gives substance to that argument. And it's a political strategy that can be used domestically to make it harder for your opponents to disagree with you. I think if we look at the um, students as object of criticism, um, we can make similar arguments as well. So in Denmark, um, by criticising students, the government is reassuring the taxpayers that their money is being used wisely. So it's having this kind of broader political goal of reassuring them that you know, they're responsible governments, they're taking care of, of taxpayers' money. And also in Denmark, in the newspapers, there's been this kind of, you know, um, debate about students being lazy. And it's so, you can see this is the government saying, actually, you know, we're taking steps to address this. We're taking steps to ensure taxpayers' money is used widely. And you could argue, and I guess I'll be interested in your views here, in Poland, where this kind of criticism of the student is perhaps used as a pretext for bringing in the higher education reforms which are kind of coming in at the moment, I understand. So again, you know, this, this kind of um, use of student as an object of criticism, doing domestic political work. And then I think if we turn to um, students as investors or investments, again, we can make similar arguments in relation to the domestic um, political context. That focusing on responsibilities of students, again, rather than their rights, might help to reassure taxpayers in um, countries 
where uh, higher education is publicly funded. Whereas in England, focusing on students' rights, again, you know, might have to assure them and their families that the government is taking action to protect their interests um, because of all the money that they are um, paying in, in their fees. But I think also, if we think about the kind of language used in these documents, it's also very affected by what is seen as acceptable political language and what is seen as not acceptable. So in England, the term consumer is now used a lot. It's, it's a widely accepted term by many. But I think that particular term in countries such as Germany, for example, is just not seen as an acceptable way to talk about higher education students. So again, we have political norms here, which can also affect what goes into um, policy documents. So then the final possible explanation I wanted to talk about was those kind of political relationships beyond the nation state. So the relationships that countries have with other countries, both within Europe and um, the world. And I think if you look at the way in which students are framed as Europeans or not, again, we can some, see some kind of links to this wider political context. So I gave you an example from Germany where the, politi the European political identity of students was really emphasised. And I think this clearly links to Germany's current position within the European Union as a, as a, as a kind of leader, um, and also their, um, their status as a, as a founding member of um, many European um, associations. <coughs> so for Germany, that political identity is, is very important. In Spain, Spain has a different relationship to the European Union. It's often seen as a much more kind of peripheral country, a country on the outside. But if you look, and there's been quite a lot of literature about official discourses, Europeanisation is often seen as a solution um, to many of the kind of domestic problems that Spain um, faces. And governments of different persuasions have used arguments about Europeanisation um, um, as a way of sort of saying you know, that that's what social and economic progress is, it's becoming more European. So again, in the Spanish documents, the way in which students are positioned as Europeans um, might be consonant with that too. And I think the Polish example is, is quite interesting. So what I understand of Poland's position to the, to the European Union is that um, although there have been various problems between the government and the European Union over recent years, in general, a large percentage of the population is supportive of staying in the European Union. But in general terms, it, um, it sees the advantages through free trade and through economic integration rather than through political integration. So I think, again, the quote I gave you from a Polish document, it's all about Polish um, students um, being advantaged um, in terms of their labour market position rather than the sense that they would take on the identity of Europeans. So again, this seems very similar to the political position that the government um, might take in relation to the European Union. We see a complete absence of this framing in England, and as you might expect, this seems to be kind of in line with broader politics that you know European influence um, is, um, is, is, is viewed with a lot of suspicion. And there's been an interesting um, an article there which has documented all the various steps in which the British government has over the years tried to minimise the influence of European policy on its higher education. So again, we can see the absence of this European frame of reference as largely in line with this broader British political position to the European Union. And I think Denmark occupies um, a third position. I said earlier that there are no references to Europe students as Europeans within the Danish documents. But I think, unlike England, the EU has been actually very influential in terms of its higher education policies. Um, but perhaps this absence of European framing is in line with what's called um, soft Euroscepticism, the fact that you know, Denmark has taken on quite a lot of policies, but there has been quite a lot of opposition to that within Denmark at all. And so it can be, again, kind of um, perhaps politically dangerous to frame your higher education policy um, too much in terms of, of Europe. Okay, so hopefully um, I've convinced you that those are three plausible um, 
arguments or explanations um, for, the, for the differences that we see in the way students are talked about in these, um, these policy documents. But kind of, you know, what, what, what relevance does this have? Um, what, what implications does this have? So, in conclusion, I was to say first of all that I think, although there are some differences um, in, in the policy document, some similarities in the policy documents, um, this, there are substantial differences uh, both between countries and within individual countries in how higher education students are understood and talked about. And I think this has implications both for students them themselves and for wider debates about Europe. So first of all, um, for students themselves. Now, if we look at the social policy literature, many people argue that you know, um, people don't just take on the, the way in which they are constructed in policy, that we have an opportunity to kind of you know, um, resist those policy constructions to some extent. But, as I was saying at the start, there's also kind of, you know, um, a large body of literature that argues that we are influenced to some extent, that, that, that how things are talked about in policy um, can limit what is said and what is not said, and the ways in which issues are talked about. And I think in relation to, to, to students, um, because policy documents are typically written by those with a lot of power in society, and students at this stage of their lives often have relatively little power, um, they might be kind of influenced by these, these wider discourses. They might affect how they themselves think about whether um, their role as a student, whether they, you know, they're worthy of criticism, if they're, they're treated as an object of criticism, whether they're an individual um, investor. But they also might show how other people in society think about them too. And that's one of the things that our project is trying to do. We're trying to look at whether there is a similarity between the ways in which students are talked about in policy and the way in which students themselves see their role um, through our student focus groups. And although we haven't really analysed the data from the student focus groups fully yet, there does seem in some areas to be quite a close correspondence between how students are talked about in their national policy and how they themselves um, see, see their role as students. So that's the first way in which I think you know, this um, has some implications. The second, I suppose, is in relation to those debates about European homogenisation that I talked about right at the start. You know, is everything the same all over Europe now? Have we seen globalisation you know, um, um, getting rid of, of, of national differences? And I think um, one of the, uh, an example of somebody who argues that actually things are pretty much the same all over Europe now is um, Stavros Mutsios, who's argued that um, the Bologna process, actively led by the European Union, has had this effect of making things very, very similar. So he says, this has introduced corporate management to universities across Europe, disintegrating the academic community, subduing the staff as a workforce under surveillance, and positioning students as consumers. And hopefully I've convinced you that you know, the empirical data raises quite a few questions about that argument. That I would say that although Bologna, European Union influence has been very um, important across the continent, there's quite a lot of complexity about how these policies are transferred across national borders, but also within um, individual national contexts too. And so, I would um, suggest that um, you know, because of the evidence that I've shared about the importance of national political um, priorities and these wider geopolitical relationships, it makes more sense to think about European policy not as something that kind of you know, makes everything similar, but that as a script that different national policy actors can pick and choose from. Um, and so, for example, in Spain, we see Europeanisation being used as a kind of rationale for, for various changes. And I think that's a kind of a more helpful way to, to think about it. But I think also um, this project um, has been quite important in, in showing that actually it's not just these kind of European initiatives, the particular ways in which higher education is funded in different countries um, can have some influence. And also by pointing out some of the quite marked differences, I think, between England on the one hand and many countries in continental Europe on the other hand, um, there do seem to, 
seem to be some enduring differences between this kind of Anglo-American model of higher education and models that we still see in continental Europe that put more emphasis on higher education as a social investment um, and, um, and, and students as an investment rather than individual investors. Okay, that's everything that I wanted to say. Um, I'm really happy to answer any questions that you've got, but also to hear your views because you are higher education students. Um, you probably have your own um, perspectives on this, as well as living in Poland, so they have trips in what you have to deny So it'd be great to have some comments and questions from that uh, from you now.